Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we are going to continue with our series on combined science paper 2 that was written in June 2019. We are going to discuss section C, which is the chemistry section. In the final exams, candidates are required to answer in two questions, but we are going to answer all the questions from number 10 to number 12. So the first question is reading, fermentation of glucose solution produces dilute ethanol. Name a physical process by which pure ethanol can be obtained from the dilute ethanol. So the physical process is known as fractional distillation. In part two, we are supposed to describe the process named in part one, which is the fractional distillation. Fractional distillation is used to separate liquids from mixture of liquids. It is useful for separating ethanol from dilute ethanol. So in general, fractional distillation basic process is that different liquids evaporate and boil at various um, temperatures. So during the heating of the mixture, the substance with a lower boiling point will start to boil fast and hence convert into vapors. Ethanol has lower boiling point than water. It is selectively evaporated and condensed in a process called fractional distillation. Let me repeat the explanation again. Fractional distillation basic process is that different liquids evaporate and boil at different temperatures. During heating, substance with a lower boiling point will start to boil fast and convert into vapors. Ethanol is a lower boiling point than water, so it is selectively evaporated and condensed. Let us move on to number 10A, part 3. Want to state N2 uses of ethanol. So it is used to manufacture alcoholic beverages such as beer and wine. Ethanol is uh, a good solvent. So it is used in medicine, for example, in the production of cough syrups. It is also used as biofuel. For example, here in Zimbabwe, uh, petrol is blended with ethanol. It is also used in the manufacture of paints, soaps, dyes, perfumes, and also it has antiseptic properties. It slows or stops growth of germs. There are so many uses of ethanol. Uh, in this question, candidates were just required to state in two uses of ethanol. Let us move on to part four. We are supposed to calculate the molecular mass of ethanol. So first we need to write down uh, the chemical formula of ethanol. We are going to take this chemical form formula, which is C2H5OH. So we are having two carbons. We are going to say 2 times 12 plus we are having six hydrogens. Uh, this 5 plus this H, so the total is six hydrogen. So we say 6 times 1. And also we are having one oxygen, which is going to contribute uh, 16 grains. So we are going to add 2 times the 12, we get 24. 24 plus 6 is equals to 30. 30 plus 16 is equals to 46. Therefore, the molecular mass of ethanol is 46 grains. Let's just move on to the next question. In part four, we want to calculate the percentage of carbon in ethanol. So first we need to calculate the mass that is contributed by carbon. We are having two carbons, so we are going to say two times 12 in order to get 24. And we say 24 over the total molecular mass of ethanol, which is 46. And then we multiply it by 100. 
we need to punch this on our calculators. So we are saying 24 over 46 times 100. We are getting 52.2%. We are going to round correct to three significant figures in order to get 52.2%. So that was all about number 10. Let, us, let me give the summary. Uh, on 10A part 1, we're supposed to name a physical process by which pure ethanol can be obtained from dilute ethanol. We use fractional distillation. And then on part 2, we're supposed to describe the fractional distillation. So it is a basic process that uh, uses the different boiling points of the mixture. So we are going to heat so that the substance with lower boiling point is going to vaporize first. And then uh, we know that ethanol has lower boiling point than water. It is going to evaporate first and condense. And then on part three, we are supposed to state N2 uses of ethanol. There are so many uses of ethanol I've listed some of the uses, such as manufacture of alcoholic beverages. It is used in medicine as cough syrup. It is used as biofuel. And then on part form, we're supposed to calculate the molecular mass of ethanol. So we are going to say in ethanol, we have two carbon, six hydrogen, and one oxygen. So we say two times 12 plus six times one plus 16 in order to get 46 grams and then in order to calculate the percentage of carbon in ethanol we are going to say the mass contributed by carbon which is 2 times 12 over the molecular mass of ethanol which is 46 times 100 in order to get 52.2 percent so let us move on to number 11 number 11a the mass number of potassium is 39 and its proton number is 19. State the number of electrons in the potassium atom. So we are going to have our electrons is uh, 19 electrons. In elements, the number of protons is also equal to the number of electrons. And then on part two, we are supposed to determine the number of neutrons in the potassium ion atom. So we are going to say, in order to get the number of neutrons, neutrons, we say 39 minus 19 in order to obtain 20 neutrons. Potassium reacts with fluorine by donating electrons. State the number of electrons donated by potassium and the charge of the potassium ion. So potassium is in group one, so it is going to lose one electron in order to gain stability. So we are going to write one here, and then the charge is going to be plus one. And then on part two, we are supposed to write the formula of potassium fluoride. It is going to be Kf, K is representing potassium and uh, F is representing fluorine. So we are going to have Kf as the formula of potassium fluoride. And then on part three, we are supposed to state N physical property of potassium fluoride. So um, you should always know that ionic compounds they have high boiling points, they have high melting points. So specifically for this potassium fluoride, it is a white crystalline solid, and also it is soluble in water and insoluble in alcohol. Let us move on to part C. Sodium hydroxide is dissolved in water to form a solution of concentration 0.5 moles per cubic decimeter. Calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in 250 
cubic centimeters of the solution. So number of moles is equals to concentration over volume. The concentration is 0 0.5 moles per cubic decimeter. And then the volume, it needs to be in decimeter. So we are going to say 250 divided by 1000 in order to obtain 0 0.25 um, cubic decimeter. So we say 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.25 in order to get two moles. So it means the number of moles is equals to two moles. Let me give a summary on number 11. We're supposed to state the number of uh, electrons in the potassium atom. We have 19 electrons. And then we want to determine the number of neutrons in order to get the number of neutrons, we say the mass number minus proton number. So we are going to say 39 minus 19 in order to get 20 neutrons. And then on part B, we are told that potassium reacts with fluorine by donating electrons. We are supposed to state the number of electrons donated by potassium. It is going to donate one electron since it is in group one of the periodic table and the charge is going to be plus one since it is losing that electrons that electron and then on past room we're supposed to write the formula of potassium fluoride it is going to be kf and then on part three we are supposed to state n1 physical property of potassium fluoride it is high boiling point high melting point, high electrical conductivity. Let us move on to the part C. On part C, we are supposed to calculate the number of moles. Uh, the number of moles is equal to concentration over volume. So we are going to say 0 0.5 moles per decimeter divided by, we convert 250 cubic centimeters into cubic decimeter. We divide by 1000 in order to get 0 0.25 so 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.25 we are going to obtain two moles let us now move on number 12 number 12 table 12.1 shows the number of bubbles produced when metals a b c and d reacted with dilute sulfuric acid for three minutes Name the gas that is produced. So you should always know that when metals react with sulfuric acid, they are going to form their corresponding sulfates and hydrogen gas. So our answer is hydrogen gas on number 12A. And then on part B, we are supposed to identify with a reason the most reactive metal. We are going to take D as our most reactive metal. Us usually, we regard um, metal as reactive if when it is added to acid, it produces lots of bubbles. Let us move on to number 12C. On C, the metals used were copper, calcium, lead, and zinc. State with a reason, the letter which represents copper. So to answer this question, you're supposed to remember the reactivity series. So I have uh, a way which we can use in order to remember the reactivity series. So this is the trick. You are going to say, please stop calling me a careless zebra. Instead, try learning copper saves gold. Let me repeat again. So you say, please stop calling me a Kale zebra. Instead, try learning copper saves gold. So P is representing potassium. Stop is representing sodium. Calling is representing calcium. Me is representing magnesium. A 
is representing aluminium, Kales is representing carbon, zebra it is representing zinc, instead is representing iron, tri is representing tin, learning is representing lead, copper represent copper and saves represent silver, gold represent gold. So this is our reactive series. So we need to, um, the reactivity is going to decrease down this reactivity series. It means that potassium is more reactive than sodium. Sodium is more reactive than calcium. Calcium is more reactive than magnesium, going with that series, right? So in part C, um, the metal used were copper, calcia calcium, lead, and zinc. We're supposed to state with the reason, the letter which represents copper. So according to this list which we are given, the most reactive is calcium, followed by zinc, followed by lead, and lastly copper. So we need to find uh, which letter is representing copper. Copper is the least reactive. So we are going to take our copper is C. The reason why we are taking our copper is C is C is the least reactive. We don't have any bubbles here. So our answer is going to be C or number 12C. In part two, we are supposed to state N1 alloy of copper. So we have brass, which is the combination of copper and zinc. We have bronze, which is the combination of copper and tin. Let me explain what is an alloy. It is a metal that is made by combining two or more metal elements, especially to give greater strength or resistance to corrosion. So um, we're supposed to just list in one alloy of copper. I've listed brass and bronze. And then on part three, we are supposed to state the metal use, used for galvanizing iron. When we are saying galvanizing, we mean to coat iron or steel with protective layer of zinc in order to prevent rusting. So we are going to write zinc on number three. And then um, D part one, we are supposed to define a compound. So a compound is a substance that is made up of two or more different chemical elements combined in fixed ratio by mass. And then on part two, we are supposed to explain why copper does not react with zinc oxide. The reason why they do not react is zinc is more reactive than copper, so copper cannot displace zinc. So that was all about number 12. On number 12, we are having a table 12.1, which is showing the number of bubbles produced when metals A, B, C, and D reacted with dilute sulfuric acid for three minutes. We are supposed to name the gas that is produced. It is hydrogen gas. And then we are supposed to identify with the reason the most reactive metal. It is going to be D because it is the one with highest number of bubbles. And then on part C, we are supposed to state with a reason the letter which represents copper. So copper is the least reactive. We are going to take C as our answer, as we can see that there was no gas bubbles that was produced. And then we are supposed to state N1 alloy of copper. We have brass, which is copper plus zinc, and zinc and also we have bronze which is copper plus tin and then on part three uh, we are supposed to state the metal used for galvanizing iron it is zinc and we are supposed to define a compound it is a substance made up of two or more different elements combined in fixed ratio by mass and then on part two we are supposed to explain why copper does not react with zinc oxide because zinc is more reactive than copper, so copper cannot displace zinc. This marks the end of our tutorial today on the chemistry section 
of combined science paper two that was retained in June 2019. Thank you so much, guys, for following me on this channel. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share my videos. I love you all. This is Eve signing out.